We'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Trust that you had a good prayer time. I know we'll take these prayer lists with us and I'll, Lord willing, be able to get this out by email in the next couple of days and we can also use maybe a digital copy as we pray for one another. But it's a, it's a real joy to hear our church family praying for one another and I know that uh, we do that on our personal time as well and our personal devotions as well as throughout uh, days of the week and uh, even special prayer requests that maybe you shared with your group that uh, we'll take with us and pray uh, for one another. All right, we have spent uh, several weeks now looking at godly motives, motives as believers that should, well, motivate us for living a godly, righteous, holy Christian life. And we've looked at uh, glory of God, the love of Christ, acceptance in, in Christ. We've looked at uh, truth, the word of God. And we've looked at uh, the next generation and the church. Uh, so many different motives. We could probably add more. And we've broken it down to 10 specific motives. And last week, uh, this is the second part, because last week we... Uh, began uh, this particular motive and looked at about half of what might be in that outline there. If you have a prayer bulletin, you might be able to follow along with the outline. There's some blanks there. If that will help you, you're, will, uh, you're welcome to, to use that. But we looked last week at a couple of questions and found some answers from the Word of God regarding heavenly rewards. I don't know if it's just because we are so strong on the grace of God, and rightly so. We're, we're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Salvation is by grace. Um, it's, it's not of works, uh, lest any man should boast, Ephesians uh, 5. And uh, we, we are uh, strong on grace, and, and we should be. But I think sometimes that has caused us to maybe avoid this biblical teaching regarding rewards because we don't deserve rewards. We don't deserve heavenly treasures. We don't deserve any of these so-called prizes, so to speak. We're, we're wretched sinners. We're, we're not worthy of receiving any good thing, any gift from God. But at the same time, we can't ignore what Scripture says about rewards. It is a motive. It is something that, as believers, that we should be striving for. Paul talked about pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We're not going to use that specific passage tonight and break that down, but 1 Corinthians 3 is very clear. According to the grace of God, verse number 10, he mentions grace right there. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another build it thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Very clear in that passage that there are heavenly rewards. There is gold, silver, and precious stones laid up in heaven, or there is wood, hay, and stubble. We could go to the parable of the talents, another passage, Matthew 25, the five, the two, and the one. The five doubled or multiplied, the one with two doubled, multiplied, the one with one buried it, did nothing with it. At the end of that parable, there is the statement, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and then there is, you shall be ruler over many things, versus the one who will be ruler over few things. There is the statement of reward in Matthew 25 in that parable. We don't have time to go to all these passages. We looked at them last week. But all of these passages speak of heavenly rewards. These are 
good works done with the right motivation after salvation. These are good works done for the glory of God because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And it is clear throughout scripture that God is going to give out rewards. 1 Corinthians 3, what are we going to have as treasures in heaven? Are we going to have gold, silver, and precious stones? Or are we going to have wood, hay, and stubble? What's the difference? Well, obviously the wood, hay, and stubble get burned up. And what makes the difference? The wood, hay, and stubble is the frivolous, empty, vain, maybe wasteful time, talents, and energies of our life. But I think specifically we could even apply it or more specifically apply it to good things that we do that are not with the right motivation. Good things that we do in order to be seen of men, in order to make ourselves look better, in order to get glory to ourselves. Selfish motivations cause our good works to be empty, worthless, fruitless. Does that mean that we're not saved? No, it doesn't mean that. A saved person is going to manifest that in good works. There's going to be fruits. But we can have a selfish motivation even in the good works that we do after we get saved and then we don't have gold, silver, and precious stones. The fiery judgment of God, not for sin. We know from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 that there is the judgment seat of Christ. I believe that this takes place during the tribulation. While God is pouring out judgment on the earth, I believe after the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ takes place, the marriage supper of the Lamb. In the meantime, the seven years of tribulation are going on here on the earth. And then, of course, at the end of that is the battle of Armageddon and then into the millennial kingdom. But at that judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 is clear. God is keeping the accounts of what we have done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. This is for believers. This is not the great white throne judgment. And I don't believe, as I was taught early on in the early days of my childhood, I was told by I don't know what preacher, there's going to be a big movie screen in the sky, and we're all going to be sitting out there in our popcorn in our nice sofa chairs with our feet propped up, and we're going to be laughing at all the dumb, sinful things that we did as believers, and then wait until it's our turn. And then we're going to, no, I don't believe it's going to be that way. I don't believe we're all going to be watching reruns of our lives. Somehow, some way, God is keeping the accounts. He's not Santa Claus with a long list of who's naughty and nice. Okay? This is God, the God of the universe, who is keeping the books, holding us into account, going to give us a test, in a sense, of how we have lived here on this earth. So does it matter how we live right now? Yes, it does. It matters for all eternity. Is it just that, oh, we've gotten saved, we've got our fire insurance, we've got our escape from hell, and then we can just do what we want? No. Paul is very clear. How shall we continue in sin? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But God is keeping record. There is an accounting. There will be rewards on whether we have done right and what we have done for good. Has it been done with the right motive? Has it been done for the glory of God? So, Colossians 2 and verse 18, 2 John and verse 8 are convicting because we see a beguilement of reward for believers in Colossae, in the, at the church of Colossae. There is a warning about a trickery, a beguilement that could cause believers to lose their reward. What's the context? False teaching, worshiping of angels, intruding into those things that, which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So we see pride and we see a disregard for God's warnings regarding false teaching, false doctrine. Believers who get too deep into 
false teaching or believers who entertain doubts and disputings. And it can cause a believer to become defeated, discouraged, disobedient, down in their Christian life, and then they lose reward. How all that is figured out, God is the one keeping the accounts. But there is clearly a message here, a warning about losing our reward. Second John in verse 8, look to, ourself, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. God wants us to have the full reward. I've been on the other side of the, the, the classroom as a teacher. I've been as a student. I was the kind of kid, I was that nerd in high school. I wanted to get all A's. I've mentioned it before. I wanted to get 100% A plus in history. I missed 100% on my last exam in my last history class my senior year. I missed it by one point. I got a 99. It still affects me to this day because it was a geography test and I put the dot like two or three inches away from the right spot somewhere over in Europe, Asia Minor. I had the city and I had it just in, I had, had it marked in like two or three inches from the right spot and the teacher said, nope, sorry, you don't get 100, you get a 99. I was that kind of a kid, especially in history class. I wanted all A's. I wanted to get a 4.0 in high school. I didn't make it. And then I had the reality of college. And I got, my, got there my freshman year and I realized all A's is not reality. <laughs> I realized I needed to back off a little bit and be willing to take a, a, a B. And then I got to Greek class and realized, okay, I gotta be happy with a C <laughs> if I can just survive. God taught me some humility. I realized I had some pride about my uh, academic desires. But the point is, I wanted a full 100%. And I've got enough perfectionism in me. I've got enough OC in me that there are things that I want. I want them done well. I want them done right. I want them done now. Sometimes I have to back off because I have to be, God teaches me to be patient. And God teaches me that I'm a big mess. And I can't just expect everybody to be 100% perfect all the time because I'm not. I mean, there's ways in which God has had to work on me, but I, I, want, I want 100% participation. I want every person who's a member of our church here every Sunday morning. And might as well be here Sunday night too and Wednesday night, right? I mean, that's just, that's just me. Part of it's being a pastor, being a preacher, but I want 100% participation. I want there to be all in. I'm a very competitive person. I can get me in trouble, but when I play sports or when I play games, I can get very into it. And God's had to teach me. But why do we not have that when it comes to the Christian life? Why is it that so many Christians sit on the sidelines and are happy to play armchair quarterback? Oh, they'll be happy to tell everybody else how to do the church and how to run the church and how, to, how the preacher should preach and how everybody else should live, but they don't want to get out there and serve and do and live, and right? So many Christians are complacent and calloused and too comfortable. What is going on in our world today when we see the evil that surrounds us and the pressure and Christians are like, oh, oh well, nothing I can do about it. I don't get that. I see in the Apostle Paul, I see in Peter, I see in John, I see in the Apostles as God reveals in his word, they were passionate about the truth, about holiness and righteousness down to their very last breath. Is that not very clear in the book of Philippians as we've been working through the book of Philippians in, 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 on Sunday mornings? Paul was passionate about righteousness and the truth and the gospel. What is wrong with us as believers that we don't have that kind of passion for the Lord, for laying up treasures in heaven? It's clear in the Bible that there are treasures to be laid up in heaven. Matthew 6 and verse 20, Matthew 19 and verse 21, Mark 10 verse 21, Luke 18 and verse 22. That would not be said, that command would not be given to lay up treasures in heaven were God not keeping the record, were God not keeping the accounts and desiring to reward us upon our entrance into glory. Right? It would not be clear in Scripture that there are treasures in heaven. I know first and foremost, that's speaking to heaven in general terms. A saved individual, every saved individual gets to heaven. There's no purgatory, there's no limbo land. 
We don't light candles and say prayers and do rosaries in order to get people from purgatory into heaven. No, all true, genuinely saved individuals enter into heaven the moment they die or at the resurrection, uh, the rapture, excuse me, when the dead in Christ shall rise first and they which are alive in Christ will join them together uh, with the Lord in the clouds. Okay, so every believer as a saved individual is given heaven will enter into heaven by God's grace through faith alone and Christ alone. But there is treasures. 1 Corinthians 3, there is gold, silver, and precious stones. So we are to be working, serving, humbly, passionately, fervently for heavenly rewards, knowing that the things that we do matter for all eternity. And, And... we sometimes think, yes there, yes, there is forgiveness for sin, but there is stewardship. Am I being a good steward when I lie and cheat and steal? Am I being a good steward if I'm involved in immorality and fornication and other kinds of sexual sins? Am I being a good steward when I waste my time and I don't spend time in God's word going to church or raising my family right? If I'm not being a, a loving husband and a good leader in my home, Does that not matter? Sure it does. It matters for all eternity. What stewardship? I have been given tremendous responsibility, having been saved at a young age, having been in the ministry for 25 plus years for being a husband, being a father. It scares me sometimes, more than sometimes, the tremendous responsibility and the accounting that I'm going to have. And we're even told in scriptures to pray for our pastors because there is... Uh, and, and accounting that they're going to give to God. But it's true of all of us. It doesn't just mean those in vocational ministry. Fathers, husbands, mothers, wives, children. Is there not a stewardship for young people and how they respond to mom and dad and how they obey and how they uh, show respect or lack thereof in various areas of their own lives as young people? Sure, God is keeping account. There are heavenly treasures. First, or excuse me, 2 Peter 1 and verse 11. This is Peter. You can see, you can hear, read the passion almost. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you. How? Abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What does that say? There might be some who enter into glory less abundantly. Shame on us if we're not entering in abundantly. Is it uh, John 10? I think it's John 10 or is it John 15? It talks about the, uh, the fruits, remaining fruit, continuing fruit, and the abounding fruits. And that speaks to the way in which we live. Are we multiplying the fruitfulness? The five talents turned into ten. The two turned into to four. Whatever the Lord has given us, are we being good stewards? Are we looking forward to a day as we have served faithfully for an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord? So then let's close tonight, quickly go through these, these crowns that are mentioned in Scripture. Crowns. Now, I often identify with the one to the upper left because I'm, uh, I lived for so many years in Indianapolis and grew up around the Indianapolis 500 could stand in my front yard as a kid and hear the the race cars. I've been to the track many times. I've only been to the race once. But that wreath, where does that come from? It comes from Greek, particularly Greek culture, and we could even go to Roman culture, but we see some different wreaths that speak to the rewards, the crowns. The one picture down in the bottom left would be from 1984, a Greek runner who won some Greek marathon in 1984, and you can see the crown on his head, this garland. Crown literally means surrounding, wreaths or garlands placed over the heads of champions, victors, dignitaries, generals, officers, athletes, signifying reward, prize, accomplishment. So what about in the scriptures? We see in 2 Timothy 4, in verse number 8, the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, in verse number 8. 
2 Timothy 4 and verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. What does the crown of righteousness have to do with? It has to do with the final state of salvation, glorification. Each of these crowns is going to highlight an aspect of heaven. But I believe that it will be a special or an extra special or for those who have been faithful, there's going to be a extra, I don't know, we sometimes call it a jewel in the crown. I don't know if that's the right way to express it. But we see that, yes, there is the aspect of heaven that involves righteousness, glorification, the perfection of Christ's righteousness in the believer in heaven, in the presence of the Savior, absent from sin, but there is something special about those who love his appearing. Truly saved individuals who live in anticipation of Christ's return, faithful, believe, faithful believers who live obediently in expectation of his return. I believe there is a extra special crown, an extra shiny crown, an extra set of jewels in their crown. I just sense that there is something that, yes, is true of all believers, but there is something additional, bonus, for those who live truly in anticipation of Christ's return and faithful and obedient in an expectation of his return. What about the crown of life? This is the joyful endurance of trials. This is going to speak to the aspect of heaven that has to do with eternal life. But notice in James 1 in verse number 12, James 1 in verse number 12, let me get to the right place here. So, sorry, wrong one. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Okay? The ones who truly love him are the ones that are truly saved. But are there not people who endure afflictions to a greater degree or magnitude than others? I can't help but think that they're going to receive a crown of life that is extra pretty, extra beautiful. It's going to have extra jewels. I, there's just a part of me that sees certain people who have endured much, much more than the, maybe the average believer. I, I can't help but think that they're not going to have a crown that's a little extra special, a little extra garland, so to speak, uh, in some way. There's a fullness to their life eternal that far surpasses any pain or suffering experienced on earth. All of us are going to experience that as believers in heaven. We're going to experience a fullness of eternal life that far surpasses any pain or suffering we had on this earth. But for those who have suffered well, and maybe have suffered often and suffered well, I just believe there's going to be a, a, another layer of praise and joy and rejoicing for them in heaven in that crown of life. And then there's the crown of rejoicing. This speaks to the joy of heaven. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse number nine, 19, excuse me. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse number 19. The psalmist talks about, at thy, at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. I don't think that we even have a clue the joy and the pleasures of heaven. God has blessed us with tremendous joys, tremendous blessings, tremendous pleasures. We are grateful, aren't we, I hope, to be living in the United States of America as bad as things can be. We still have it very good compared to a lot of places in the world and a lot of other times in history. We still have it pretty good. But as good as we might have it with dual climate seats and controls in our cars and all of the accessories that we have in our, uh, our homes and all the techno gadgets that we have that seem to make life sometimes easy and other times complicated. <laughs> we have it so good, and yet in heaven it's going to be so much better. The pleasures are going to be so much greater with a joy that is sinless, that's going to be without the hindrances of sin. There is great joy in heaven. And then there's the incorruptible crown. This is 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25. 
And every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I know immediately the application is there is a uh, application for the unsaved who are living by their works for selfish reasons to try to earn favor with God. They are going to get what? If they reject Jesus Christ as their Savior, their good works being filthy rags, what are they going to get as their crown? A corruptible crown. It, it, uh, sadly, it's, it's what? Sobering reality is it's, it's hell. It's eternal life with, without God. Eternal damnation. But for believers, it is an incorruptible crown. We don't have time to go to 1 Corinthians and read the verses that are listed here on the screen about the victory over corruption. Wish we had time to go to 1 Peter 1. But just imagine a place with no decay, no death, no corruption, no sin, no vice, no rust, no mold. What is it in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal? Imagine a place. We can't even comprehend a place like that. But that's heaven. That's the incorruptible crown, a place where there's no corruption of any kind. Tears are wiped away, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. We long for that day. When we wake up every morning and we don't have to go very far, we have our devotions, we pray, and then we turn on the news and we're like, Lord, <laughs> come quickly, right? And then there's the crown of glory. Literally, it has to do with the flower that's the amaranth. And it's the crown that is eternal glory. 1 Peter 5 and verse number 4. 1 Peter 5 and verse number 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Heaven is a place of glory. And whose glory is going to fill every space of heaven? God's glory. And it's not going to be inhibited by our sin. It's going to be a place of eternal glory perfection. God dwelling with men in heaven in a place where there's no sin, no corruption. Heaven is a place of glory. So what happens to all of these rewards, these crowns? When we get to heaven and we receive them at the judgment seat of Christ, what do we do with them? Revelation 4 says we cast our crowns. All of those treasures, all of that gold, silver, and precious stones we place them at the feet of Jesus. What if there's only a handful? What if there's very little? What does that say about our praise? The level of our joy, the level of our... Does everybody get heaven? Yes. Does everybody get eternal life? Yes. Who's truly born again, of course, is what I'm speaking of. Those who are truly born again, saved. They all get heaven. But... Wouldn't it be great to have crowns and heavenly treasures to lay at our Savior's feet, lay at our Savior's feet, that He, by His grace and by His power, allowed us to earn in the first place that we couldn't do on our own, and then to be able to have that kind of a celebration? Isn't it a shame when we come to? And I don't want to make I don't want to make light of heaven. I know we're we're out of time. I don't want to make light of heaven. But isn't it sad when we come to a party and we don't have anything to, to bring? We have no pop, we don't have any dessert, we don't have any chips, we don't have any gifts. Isn't it a shame to come to a party and have nothing? You're invited, you're accepted, you're RSVP, and then you just show up and you're like, hey everybody, give me, give me, give me. Isn't it kind of a shame when we don't bring anything? Have you ever been there and you've gone... Um, last minute and you realize, oh, I don't have anything for the party. And what do you do? You stop at the store, you go into the gas station, you spend five times what you would normally spend because you got to bite at the gas station or the convenience store, right? And you wish that you would... We don't want to go to a party empty-handed. We don't want to go to a gathering empty-handed. Can I not make that application to heaven? Do we want to go to heaven as believers, truly born again, but go empty-handed, no souls? No family leadership, no people we've shared the gospel with who have been saved, no gold, silver, precious stones, nothing to lay at the feet of Jesus or very little to celebrate, to praise, to bring him glory and praise and honor. 
shame on us if we go into heaven with very little fruit. May we have this motivation of heavenly rewards to his glory and only by his grace. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this topic, Lord, that helps us in our motivation. Lord, we've looked at nine other areas of motivation that should rightly motivate us, but Lord, we should also be striving to enter into glory abundantly with faithfulness, with treasures laid up, with gold, silver, and precious stones. May we desire that for your honor and for your glory, knowing we can only accomplish that by your grace. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people. I pray that you guide and direct in our lives through the remainder of this week and bring us back together, Lord willing, on Sunday. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here. Have a great rest of the week. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday.